morning. Welcome to the stream. Just getting start just getting started here.
My first thought was he lied in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye, asking to watch the working of his lie on mine, and most scarce able to afford suppression of the glee that pursed and scored its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff, what saved wailing with his lies and snare, all travelers who, fought, who might find him posted there, and ask the road, I guessed what skull like laugh would break, or crutch can write my epitaph for pastime in the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside into ominous track, which all agree hides the dark power, yet acquiescingly at his turn as he pointed, neither pride nor hope were kindling at the end described, so much as gladness some end might be. For what with my whole world wide wondering, what with my search drawn out through years, my hope dwindled into a ghost not fit to cope with that obstreperous joy success would bring. I hardly tried now to rebuke the spring my heart made, finding failure in its scope. As a sick man very near to death seems dead indeed, and feels begin and end in tears, and takes farewell of each friend, and hears one bid the other go, draw breath freelier outside, since all is over, he saith, and the blow fallen no grieving can amend. While some discuss if near other graves be room enough for this, and when a day suits best for carrying the corpse away, with care about banners, scarfs, and staves, and still the man nears all and only craves, he may not shame such tender love and stay. Thus I had for so long suffered in this quest, heard failure prophesied so oft be writ, so many times among the band of wit, the knights who to dark tower search address their steps, the just to fail as they seem best, and all doubt was now should I be fit. So quiet as despair I turned from him, that hateful cripple, out of his highway into the path he pointed. All the day had been a dreary one at best, and dim was settling into its close, yet shot one grim red leer to see the plain catch its astray. For mark, no sooner was I fairly found, pledged the plain after a pace or two, than pausing through backward a last view, over the safe road twas gone, gray plain all round, nothing but plain to horizons bound. I must go on, naught else remained to do. So on I went. I think I never saw so starved a noble nature. Nothing throve, for flowers as well expect a cedar grove. But chortle and spurge, according to their law, might propagate their kind with none to awe. You'd think a burr had been a treasure trove. No penury and nurtness in grimace in some strange sort were the land's portion. See or close your eyes, said nature peevishly. In nothing skills, I can't help my case. Tis last judgment fire must cure this place. Calcine its clods and set my prisoners free. If there pushed any ragged this stalk above its mates, its head was chopped. The beds were jealous else. What made the holes and rents and the dog's harsh sores leaves? Bruise as to walk, all hope for greenness. Tis a brute must walk, passion their life over brutes and tents. As for the grass, it grew as scarce as hair in leprosy. Thin dry blades pricked the mud, which underneath looked kneaded up with blood. One stiff blind horse, as every bone is stared, stood stupefied however he came there, thrust out past service in the devil's stud. Alive, he might be dead for aught I know, with red, gaunt, and callop neck a strain, and shut eyes beneath the rusty mane. Seldom went such grotesqueness with such woe. I never saw a brute I hated so. He must have been wicked to deserve such pain. I shut my eyes and turned them on my heart, as a man calls for wine before he fights. I asked one draft of earlier, happier sights, ere fitly I could hope to play the part. Think first, fight afterwards, the soldier's art. One taste of old times, that's all to rights. Not it, I fancied Cuthbert's reddening face beneath its garniture of curly gold. Dear fellow, till I almost felt him fold, an arm in mine to fix me to that place. That way he used, alas, one night's disgrace, I wet my heart's new fire and left it cold. Giles then, the soul of honor, there he stands, Frank as ten years ago when night at first, an honest man should dare he said he durst, good but the scene shifts, fall what hangman's hand pinned to his breast the parchment, his own band reads it, poor traitor spit upon and cursed. Better this present than a past like that, back therefore to my darkening path, no sound of sight as far as the eye can strain, will the night send a howl or a bat I ask? But something on the dismal flat came to arrest my thoughts and change their train. A sudden little river crossed my path, as unexpected as a serpent came, no tides congenial to the glooms. This is a frost by might have been a bath of the fiends going hoof. 
to see the wrath of its black eddies be spat with flakes and spoons. So petty and so spiteful, all along little scrubby Alden is kneeled over it, drenched willows flung them headlong in a fit of rout and despair, a suicidal throng, the river which had done them all the wrong, whatever that was, rolled by, deterred no whit. When while I forded good saints, how I feared to set my foot upon a dead man's cheek, each step or feel the spear I thrust to seek, for hollows tangled in his hair or beard, and may have been a water rat I speared, but I get sounded like a baby shriek. Glad was I to reach other bank, now for a better country, vain presage, who are the strugglers, what war did they wage, whose savage trample could thus pad the dank soil to a clash, toads in a poison tank, a wild cat in a red hot cage. More than that, a furlong on, why there? What bad use was that engine for? That wheel, or break not wheel, that harrow fit to reel, men's bodies out like silk, with all the air of Coffet's tool, on earth left unaware, or brought to sharpen its rusty teeth of steel. Then came some stub gun, once a wood, next a marsh would seem, now mere earth, desperate and done with, so the fool finds mirth, makes a thing and mars it, till his mood changes, and off he goes, Within a rude bog clay and marsh, sand and stark black dirt. Now blotches rankling, color gay and grim. Now patches where some leanness of the soil's broken to gloss or substances like boils. Then came a palsied oak, a cleft in him, a distorted mouth that splits its rim, gaping at death and dies while it recoils. As far as ever from the end, not in distance but the evening not, point my footsteps further at the thought. Great black bird, Apollyon's bosom friend, sail past, their beat his wide wings, dragon pen, to brush my cap, perchance the guide I saw. For looking up aware I somehow grew, the plain to give place all round to mountains with such names to grace mere heights and heaps now stolen in view. How thus they surprised me, saw the you, how to get from there was no clear case. Yet half I seem to recognize some trick of mischief had happened to me, God knows when, in a bad dream perhaps, here ended then progress this way, when in the very nick of giving up one more time came a click, as when the trap shuts you're in the den. Burningly it came upon me all at once, this was the place, those two hills crouched like two bulls all horn and horn in fight, while to the left tall scout mountain, dunce doddered a dozing at the very nuns after a lifetime of training for the sight. What in the midst lay but the tower itself, the round squat turret, blind as a fool's heart, built of brown stone without a counterpart in the whole world. The tempest's mocking out, points to the shipman thus the unseen shelf, he strikes on only when timbers start. Not see, because of night perhaps, why day came back for that, behind it left the dying sunset kindled to a cleft. The hills like two giants in the hunting lay, chin upon hand to see the game at bay, now stab and end the creature to the heft. Not here, because of when noise was everywhere it told, increasing like a bell, names in my ears, of lost adventurers, my peers, how such was strong, and such was bold, and such was fortunate, yet each of old, lost, lost, one moment now the woe of years. There they stood, ranged along the hillside met, to view the last of me, a living frame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless the slughorn to my lips I sat and blew, child rolling to a dark tower came. Hamlin towns in Brunswick by famous Hanover City. The river Wester deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A 
pleasanter spot you've never spied. But when begins my ditty, almost 500 years ago, to see the townsfolk suffer so from vermin was a pity. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cat, and bit the babies in the cradles, and ate the cheeses from the vats, and licked the soup from the cook's own ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking with shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. "'Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with vermin, for dolts who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you're old and obese to find the furry civic robes ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, to find the remedy we are lacking, or sure as fate will send you packing. At this, the mayor and the corporation quaked with a mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council, at length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder eyed my ermine gown cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should have? At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little through wondrous fat. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister, than too long open moister, save when at noon his paunch was mutinous, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat, anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and it did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red. And he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light his hair and swore his skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin, but lips or smile went out and in. There was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quote one, it's as my great grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, had walked his had watched. Into the street, the piper stepped, smiling for us a little smile, as if he knew what magic stepped in his quiet pipe a while. Like a musical adept, he blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And ere three shrill notes of pipe uttered, he heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, and the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, steam rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, blue rats, tony rats, brave old potters, gay and friskers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed the pipe piper for their lives, from street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wester, wherein all plunged and perished, save one who stouts as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as he the manuscript he cherished, to Ratland home his commentary. Which was, after a shrill notes of the pipe, I heard a sound as a scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the cider press's grape, and moving away of pickle cupboards, and leaving a jar of conserve cupboards, and drawing the corks of train oil flasks, and the breaking hoops of butter casks, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than by harp or by salaries breathed, called out, Oh, rats, rejoice, the world has grown to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just a bulky sugar punch on, already stave like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce an inch before me, just me thought it said, come for me, found the western rolling over me. You should have heard the Hamlin people ring the bells so they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mayor, get long poles, poke up the nest and block up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, and even our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the piper perked in the marketplace, the first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too, for counts of dinners made rare havoc with Clary and Moselle, Vin de Grave Hawk, and half the money wouldn't punish and sell his biggest butt of Rhenish to pay the sum to a wondering fellow with gypsy coat red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with her eyes the vermin sink. What's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we're not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink and a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guilders, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was in joke. 
Besides a loss to me as thrifty, thousand guilders, come take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried, no trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise to visit by dinner time Baghdad, except to prime the head cook's potage, all he's rich in, having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver, with you don't think I'll be a stiver, and folks who put me in a passion, may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I broke, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vesture piebald? Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe and smooth straight cane, and there he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as the musicians cutting never gave in raptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, a merry crowd's jostling and pitching and hustling, small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering, like foals in the farm and barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping around merrily after the wonderful music was shouting in laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood as if they're changed in the blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by, could only follow with an eye that joined the crowd of piper's back. And how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched council's bosom beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the west rolled its waters, right in the way of their sons and daughters. How it returned from south to west, and to Cockleburg Hill his steps addressed. And after him the children pressed, great was the joy in every breast. He never crossed the mighty top, he's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. Below they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced and the children followed, and when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all? No one was lame, and could not dance a hold the way. And in after years, if you would blame the sadness, you used to say, is dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I'm bereft of all the pleasant sights to see, which the piper also promised me, for he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town in jests at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, the flowers were forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrow was bright in a peacock here, and their dogs were brown our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings, and horses were born with eagle's wings, and just as I became assured, my lame foot would be speedily cured. The music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas for Hamelin, it came into many a burger's pate, a text which says that heaven's gate opes to the rich at as easy rate as the needle's eye takes a camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, if only he'd return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, and piper and dancers were gone forever, they made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here, on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they call it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing Piper Tabor was sure for his future to lose his labor, where suffered they hostile their tavern, shocked with mirth the street so solemn, and opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote a story on a column, and on a great church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted, how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day. And I must not admit to say, that in Transylvania there is a tribe of alien people who ascribe the way and dress of which their neighbors lay such stress to their fathers and mothers having risen out of some subterranean prison into which they were Japan a long time ago in a mighty band out of Hamlin towns in Brunswick land. But how or why they don't understand. So, Lily, let me and you be wipers that scores out with all men, especially pipers. And if they should pipe us free from rats and mice, if we promise them not, let us keep our promise.
There once was a young man named Roland Pide who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing his recorder to rest a while from all his baking when suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he needed that day. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He'd bake until he was tired, then he would pull his recorder out of his pocket while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor decided, so the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of Roland. In the beginning, he said that Roland was a good worker, but lazy. Next, he said that Roland baked a whole lot, but badly. Then he accused Roland of being a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Roland Pied therefore took his recorder and left his home behind. When Roland came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep his body and mind together. Come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms together. So Roland Pied and the old man started going round and singing, Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to clean. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. You are, Baker, lie in the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, stand where your feet are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but to Roland they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pied. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry soldiers to feed. There's a king with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages to anyone willing to feed them. So Roland Pied went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland Pied mixed the dough, then he rolled it into rings. Then he baked, then he boiled them, dressed them with seeds, and baked them until they were baked golden brown. Then he tossed them into a crate to cool down. Whenever Roland weary, wearied of baking, he would, he would play his recorder. And once he was wary of playing his recorder, he would sing. Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to cream. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are. Not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, be who you are. 
hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. She saw Roland Pied and fell in love with him. But she was a princess and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They, were, they fled at night in a boat. When they were already on the high seas, Roland remembered the, the busker. He said to his beloved, we must fetch the old man since he shared his alms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, We agreed to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I own. Now you have the king's daughter. You must give half of her to me. At that, he gave the... At that, he gave Roland Pied a knife to cut his bride in half. Roland Pied took the knife in a trend, tre with a trembling hand. You are right, he said. You are perfectly right. He was at the point of cutting his bride in half when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop! I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you buried with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. The old man walked away on the waves, and the boat came to an island rich in all good things, with a princely palace awaiting the newlyweds. That was Roland Pied in the Oven Blade. That story is a parable, which means it is a, um, a narrative that tells a concrete narrative that, that um, has a subtext.
Hola, guten tag, good morning. Welcome to the stream. Uh, I'm baking bagels this morning, Montreal style bagels. I have two batches in the oven. I'm um, baking bagels, yes. Montreal style bagels. I was reciting poetry earlier and, and I told a story. Um, but I've done that. In they go into the oven. Told the story. Um, I guess I could, I'll try. To, I can tell you again. Um, mm -mm. So this is uh, this is called rolling pie in the oven blade. There once was an old. There once was a young man named Roland Pie, who played the recorder when he wasn't baking bagels. One day he was walking through a park and playing music with the recorder to rest a while from all his baking. When suddenly he spied a corpse lying on the ground beneath a swarm of flies. He put down his recorder, walked over to the corpse, shooed the flies away, and covered the dead man with stones. Returning to his oven later that day, he found that his oven blade had gone on by itself and already baked half the bagels he'd needed that day. From that day on, Roland Pied was the happiest baker alive. He would bake until he was tired. Then he would pull out his recorder and, and while, his reco while his oven blade went on by itself. But Roland lived in a town whose mayor did not admire his skill and was jealous of his fame. So the mayor devised a plan to rid the town of, of Roland Pye. In the beginning he said that Roland Pye was a good worker but lazy. Next he said that Roland Pye baked a whole lot but badly. Then he accused Roland Pied of being a sorcerer, and the people turned on him. Therefore, Roland Pied took his recorder and left the town behind. When he came to a neighboring town, he went to all the business owners, but none of them would give him any work. Finally, he met an old busker and asked him for work to keep body and mind together. The old man, come along with me, said the old man, and we will share alms. So Roland Pied and the old man started going around together and singing, Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, how did you forget to stand where your feet are? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the old, the, your limbs are the knots and cords and old, of an old-fashioned machine. Baker, line the rings and bash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, stand where your feet are. Everybody gave alms to the old man, but to Roland Pied they said, What is a young man like you out begging? Why don't you, why don't you work for a living? Nobody will hire me, replied Roland Pied. That's what you say. There is a king with so many hungry, with so many hungry soldiers that he'll pay good wages, wages to anyone willing to feed them. 
So Roland Pied went to the king's kitchen and took the old man whose alms he'd been sharing. The oven had never been used by anyone. Roland mixed the dough, rolled it into rings. Then he, then he, uh, then he boiled them, dressed them with seeds, and baked them until they were golden brown. Then he tossed them into a crate to let them cool down. Whenever Roland tired of baking, he would pull out his recorder and play. Whenever and once he was, once he was wary of playing his recorder, he would sing, "Baker, why do you bear those silent things? Baker, no woman loves your wealth, although it is golden and good for her health. Baker, you are too dirty for a lover to wish to preen. Your limbs are the knots and cords of an old-fashioned machine." Baker, line the rings and dash the boards. You don't need their applause for a thing that is yours. You are a baker and are what you are, not by a miracle, but by the work of your arms. Baker, stand, Baker, be who you are. Hearing the singing, a princess looked out the window. When she saw Roland Pied, she fell in love with him. But she was a princess, and he a baker. The king would never consent to their marriage. So they decided to run away together. They fled at night in a boat. When they were already on the high seas, uh, Roland remembered the busker. He said to his beloved, We must fetch the old man since he shared his alms with me. We can't go off and leave him like that. At that very moment, the old man came up behind the boat, walking on the water as though it had been dry land. Reaching the boat, he said, We agreed to divide everything we had, and I shared everything I owned. Now you have the king's daughter and must give half, give half of her to me. At this he gave Roland Pied a knife to cut his bride in half. Roland Pied took the knife in a trembling hand. He said, You are right. You are perfectly right. He was on the point of cutting his bride in half when suddenly the old man stopped him. Stop! I knew you were a just man. I am the dead man, mind you, whom you covered with stones. Go now, and may the two of you always be happy. The old man walked away on the waves. And the, the boat came to an island rich in all good things, and a princely palace awaited the newlyweds. Uh, that was Roland Pied in the Oven Blade. That's the whole story. I can also write, uh, recite some poetry, if you'd like. Um, beauty of woman in a wise heart's words, and men at arms that are ne'er nobility. 
the colloquies of love, the songs of birds, and hands and ships running, and hands of ships on the fast running sea. The calmness of air as daybreak looms, and white snow falling on a windless day. A flowing brook, a meadow full of blooms, silver and gold and lapis in array. Heart asks pleasure first, and then excuse from pain, and then those little anodynes that deaden suffering, and then to go to sleep, and then if it should be the will of its inquisitor, the liberty to die. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I yeah do enjoy. I don't think so. Bye. Yeah, I do enjoy what I'm doing. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We're gonna end the stream pretty soon here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Check in. I I, uh, I don't stream every day. Um, I usually work five days a week, but I. Uh, I only stream like maybe one or two. Oh, good, thank you. I, I just uh, I just memorized that story by uh, about Roland Pied and the Oven Blade. It's um it's based on an a, Italian folklore. Um, it's, it's actually a story from uh, Italo Cal Calvino, Italo Calvino's uh, Italian folklore, uh, or folk tales, Italian folk tales. Um, but I've modified it for my own, uh, my own use. I invented a new name, Roland Pied is my is the character that I uh, have imagined. What I, I need to do. Goes very Morning. Oh yeah, this is a beautiful oven. Yeah, these uh, these ovens are made by a company in Bellingham, Washington. I think yeah, they have. I think they have a manufacturing facility in Bellingham, Washington. Um, uh, but they're called uh, 
They're called wood stone. Uh, the oven right now is at uh, 369, but that's a sort of a that's a sort of a general temperature. Of, uh, it's all like it's hotter at the oven. Like the, the the temperature actually varies quite a bit. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, so it's probably about 400 degrees at the back and probably about 350 at the front. So that that number there is probably more of an average, I guess. Or uh, I, I guess not an average, but it's not entirely accurate, I don't say. Uh, you, you notice, uh, oh yeah, sorry, okay, you're good. Um, I'm switching the bagels at the end of the boards, and the reason I do that is because uh, the front of the oven is quite a bit cooler than the back of the oven. Uh, so that's the reason, because right, right in that front corner is the hottest part of the oven. And then uh, right about here is where, this, this is the Goldilocks area, this half of the oven, this is where you want the bagels to sit. That's that's where Goldilocks would want to be. So. Almost done. Um, uh, I guess uh, about uh, eight eight hundred to a thousand. I guess yeah, about that. At this location, um, there's we have another location that's on Main Street and West Broadway in Vancouver, and they um, they. They bake a l quite a bit more than we do there. I love baking in these ovens too. They're fantastic. They're really. Yeah. Yeah, they're beautiful. Uh, these these boards are mahogany. We we use mahogany because it's a it's a hard durable wood that lasts. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, mahogany. Yeah. 
are these are sesame bagels. So now I have two batches in the oven, two multigrain, and I'm about to take my rosemary rock salt out of the oven, or out of my pot, I should say, put it on the table. The general order of things is, first we boil the bagels in the pot, then we put them on the table, dress them with seeds, or put salt on them or nothing at all. Then we put them in the oven, bake them until they're golden brown. There's four stages in the oven. Then we pull them out and let them cool down on in a, in a crate. Uh, they're rock, the rock, rock salt. Uh, the name of the bagel is Rosemary Rock Salt. So it's a, it's a plain bagel with rosemary mixed into the dough and uh, rock salt added, uh, added as a topping right before we bake it. I'll show you in a minute here. It's again, putting the bagels on the boards now. I gotta do it fairly quickly because I want to have the bagels wet when I put the salt on because bagels need to be wet for the salt to stick properly. Here I'm just, I'm reshaping Reshaping the bagels, making the hole a little bit wider, making them a little bit rounder. They get sort of slightly punished in the pot, so slightly punished. I also have to do this quite quickly because my there's a batch of um, multigrain in the oven right now that needs to be checked. I'm not sure if it needs to be taken out yet, but. Um, the reason they're round is because they 
the way they bake. Um, you just you get more surface area that, for toasting, right? On the outside. A bagel is all about its crust, in my opinion. You need a nice, crisp, chewy crust. I'm gonna put another batch of rosemary rock salt in my pot now. I used to, when I first started for this company about five years ago, we, we used to make uh, rugula. Um, we, we plan to bring it back eventually. Rugula is like a, a pastry that has cream cheese mixed into the dough. Um, it's like a mini croissant, like a, a sweet, um, sweet croissant, I guess. Um, sweet mini croissant. We also made like stuffed bagels, but uh, right now we're just doing bagels right now, so yeah. I'd like to try some other things in these ovens. I'd like to try doing scones. Um, and I think cookies would be another thing that we could do in this oven. These got ovens pretty good, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to try scones and croissants. It would be something I'd like to try, so. So I, I, I did that too early. Oh, um, um, what is this going? It's like, it's like sort of like a biscuit. Uh, like a, like a, it's an English thing. It's like a tea biscuit type thing. I don't know. Mm. They're sort of like, they're sort of crumbly and they, they have, uh, I think I have butter mixed. Uh, they're 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 cr no. Yeah, I don't I don't know how to describe a scone. They're, they're sort of like a biscuit. Yeah. A lot of times they have like cheese or something added to the to the dough. I uh, I made I flipped these I flipped those uh, rosemary rocks all too soon. I got distracted. Some people came to the door, um, but we're not open until seven o'clock, so they, they're a little bit early. It's almost it's only like quarter past six right now. Yeah, bagels are awesome. I do love bagels. Um, I'm gonna end the stream pretty soon here. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll probably be, I'll be back tomorrow morning. I've been uh, I've been busy training another baker at another location, so I haven't been streaming as much. Well, thank you, thank you for watching. 
drop in any time. Here, I'll show you. I'll show you some finished bagels. These are these are sesame. And then uh, then I'll end I'll end the stream. Oh yeah, it's it's a great job. I love it. Yeah, it's a great job for an introvert. If you're an introvert, this is the job for you. <laughs> Anyways, here uh, I'm just gonna show you some bagels. These are uh, this is this is two batches of sesame bagels. There you go, beauties. And then uh, here's this is the inside of the oven right now. So you can see there is there's two.